The car that sits on your driveway or in your garage probably isn't a unique vehicle. You might like it a lot, but that doesn't make it unique. The vehicles we see and use every day, whether they're cars, buses, trains, or planes, are mass-produced. That isn't the way every vehicle is made, though. Some of them are one-of-a-kind builds, and once they've served their purpose, they're left abandoned. That's been the fate of every incredible vehicle you're about to see in this video. When the Expo World Fair came to Vancouver, Canada in 1986, it was a big deal for the city and for the firms and businesses who wanted to exhibit their goods there. One company in particular went a little bit over the top with their presentation and left the city with a floating gift that it's never been able to find a new purpose for. This is the McBarge, a 180-foot-long boat made of steel and glass that was used as a water-based McDonald's restaurant during the Expo Fair, but hasn't welcomed a single customer for any reason in the more than 30 years that have passed since then. McDonald's had no plans for it after the Expo was over, and so it's been left to deteriorate out on the water slowly. There was talk of it being turned into a bar a few years ago, but nothing ever came of those plans. It's still tethered up, waiting for someone to come give it a new purpose. Surely somebody wants it. There are millions of Batman fans all over the world, and the majority of them have dreamed of owning their own version of the Batmobile, Batman's famous car. We're sure if you owned one, you'd look after it like it was your own child. And if you couldn't care for it, you'd make big money selling it to someone who could. That's why it makes no sense to us whatsoever that this 1990-style Batmobile has been left rotting in the woods. The photographer who discovered it hasn't given away its location, possibly because they have ideas about taking it away themselves. But it's still sad to see it in this state. It looks like it was modeled on the vehicle driven by Michael Keaton in the Tim Burton Batman films, but it's definitely seen better days. There's barely anything more than a shell of it left. Our best guess is that it may have once been on display at a Six Flags theme park, but even then, we have no idea why they just discard their exhibit so carelessly. At the risk of stating the obvious, coal mining is a dangerous and specialized job, and it sometimes requires dangerous and specialized equipment to do the job properly. That's why the colossal machine Bagger 258 was created in East Germany back in the 1960s. This beast of a digger was produced by a company called Lockhammer and should technically be called a bucket wheel excavator. It's 160 feet tall and more than 500 feet long. Each of its 10 blades can slice 50 feet into the ground and its buckets can hold 5,000 square feet of coal at any one time. It can even feed some of that coal into its own engines to keep itself moving. Although it's one of the most powerful and advanced vehicles ever built, it's had nothing to do since 2002. It's excavated all the coal there is to be found at its current location, and the task of moving it somewhere else to start digging again is a daunting one. There are a lot of strange ideas happening at once in the movie Mystery Men, and the film isn't to everybody's taste. There's something about it that most people can agree on, though. And that's the fact that the Herkimer Battle Jitney is one of the coolest movie trucks of all time. Calling it a truck seems disrespectful. This hulk of a vehicle is an Art Deco masterpiece, with an intimidating silhouette and a dusty, rusty shell that makes it look and feel like a war veteran. As Dr. Heller says in the film, it's the finest non-lethal military vehicle ever made. After all the buildup, the truck is only on screen for five minutes. Perhaps if they'd given us more than five minutes, the movie wouldn't have been such a failure. Sadly, it doesn't seem like the Herkimer Battle Jitney had an improvement in its fortunes after the cameras stopped rolling. It was last seen abandoned in a junkyard, where someone managed to grab some pictures of it and upload them to Reddit. There's a disused warehouse in Ninzi Novgorod, Russia, that's hiding a top-secret Ekranoplan from the 1990s, and it might still one day take flight. An Ekranoplan is an aircraft that can fly at low altitude at high speeds using ground effect. 
Typically, they're built to fly over water. This particular Acronoplan was built as part of a Spasado project, which translates to rescuer. When the building process started, it was intended that the Spasado would become a missile carrier, but that intention changed over time, and it was reimagined as a futuristic ambulance. Sadly, the vehicle in the Nitsi Novgorod warehouse is only the prototype and was never completed. The government withdrew funding from the project with roughly 90% of it complete. A group of Spasado enthusiasts is trying to raise funds to complete the building process to this day, but with the work being extremely complicated and the parts being difficult to acquire without government support, it's doubtful that they'll ever succeed. If you've ever seen any of the Mad Max movies, you might have seen a tank that looks a little like this. The films are set in a dystopian world where vehicles are cobbled together with spare parts and whatever materials are available at the time. This tank was built with the same philosophy. It looks like a tank, and it moves like a tank, but you can tell by looking at it that it's not designed to military standards. That's because it was built by and for Mexican drug lords. The police in the country have found several of these so-called narco tanks in the state of Tamaulipas recently. They've started to worry about how advanced the tanks are becoming. The model you see here has peepholes for snipers, a swiveling central turret, and the ability to eject oil and nails onto the road behind it. The tanks are built on truck beds but with one inch thick steel plating used as the body. Up to 20 people can fit inside at one time. So far, none of the narco tanks have been used in incidents with the police. Instead, they're used by rival drug gangs in battles against each other. The Ecto-1 car from Ghostbusters might not be quite as iconic as the Batmobile, but it's still one of the most recognizable movie vehicles of all time. Most people assume the cars were based around a hearse but they're actually a repurposed 1959 Cadillac Miller Meteor Ambulance. Three of the vehicles were used in the filming of the second Ghostbusters movie, where the car was known as Ecto-1A. One of the models belongs to Dan Aykroyd, a second model belongs to Sony Pictures and is used for exhibitions, the third also belongs to Sony, but as you can see, it's in a poor state of repair. The car was supposed to be refurbished and restored in 2007, but the restoration project was cancelled for unknown reasons, and since then, the old movie car has been facing an uncertain fate. A group of Ghostbusters fans petitioned Sony to sell the car to them for scrap value so they could restore it, but there have been no updates on the fan site since 2013. We can't even say for sure that this beaten down former ghost catching car hasn't joined the rest of the ghosts in the afterlife. A single abandoned bicycle wouldn't be remarkable. You'll see at least one when you walk around any modern city center. Seeing 10 of them might be unusual. Seeing 5,000 of them at once is astonishing. But that's how many were left behind by lazy festival goers after the Burning Man Festival in 2017. The motto of the festival in the desert is to leave no trace, but apparently several thousand of the people who turned up either didn't know about that motto or simply didn't care. A few days after the festival, after desert winds had whipped sands across the unwanted two-wheelers, they took on a post-apocalyptic scene. Fortunately, kind-hearted citizens stepped in where the festival goers had failed and began to load up truckfuls of the bikes to give away to charity. After the coating of sand was removed, most of the bikes were in excellent condition and would therefore make a great gift for somebody in need of one. Many of them have since been given to people who've lost their possessions in natural disasters. We all know where submarines are supposed to be, under the sea. How is it then that the largest diesel submarine ever owned by the Russian Navy has been left on grassland in Togliati for over a decade? It's become an attraction to visitors to the region, and since 2016, you can even go to see it on an official guided tour. But what's it doing there in the first place? The colossal vessel known as Submarine B-307 began military service in 1980. She managed to stay out of major conflicts during her time in the water, which was largely split between the Mediterranean and the Barents. 
By 2001, it was decided that she'd served for long enough, and so she was officially retired from the Northern Fleet. She was then bought by a museum, and this is where she ended up. Even though she's only three miles from the sea, it took nine military tractors to pull her into position. Given that she's 300 feet long and weighs 2,000 tons, that probably isn't surprising. She's considered as a permanent exhibit at her current location and will hopefully remain there for many years to come. General Motors are a huge deal in the world of manufacturing vehicles, and back in the 1950s, they very nearly gave us the next generation of trains. The GM Aerotrain was a brand new concept born out of a simple fact. The Electromotive Division of GM was selling most of their goods to train companies, and GM thought they might be able to cut their customers out of the deal by building the whole trains themselves. Their idea wasn't bad. Their aluminum bus-bodied trains were lightweight and highly maneuverable, capable of reaching 100 miles per hour at full speed. That may not sound like much now, but back then it was pushing the limits of technology. Unfortunately, GM hadn't considered some of the practical limitations. The trains were so light that they lacked the force required to get up some hills, and the high-speed trains came at the expense of customer comfort. They rattled around on the rails and the public didn't enjoy the experience. Instead of trying to redesign them, GM accepted defeat. Both prototypes were back in the warehouse barely a year after their 1956 launch and are now museum pieces. Traveling to the North or South Pole is considered to be a dangerous and taxing experience on the human body in this day and age. Back when people were attempting it during the early 20th century using far less technology than modern explorers enjoy, it was a mission only for the brave or the crazy. Things might have been a little easier for those 20th century explorers if the Fordson Snow Devil hadn't been a failure, though. The principle behind the vehicle, which was built during the 1920s, was a sound one. It was a tractor with the wheels removed and two huge rotating screws installed in their place. The idea was that the screws would be able to gain a grip on any type of terrain, whether hard or soft, and therefore propel people across the landscape in comfort. They worked without a load attached to them, but failed in the field when they were required to drag weight along behind them. Three Fordson Snow Devils suffered motor failure while dragging 15 tons of goods in Alaska in 1926, and the manufacturer was forced to concede that his invention was non-viable. There were plenty of oil tankers around in 1919, but none like the SS Palo Alto. She was a ship built to prove that a solution could be found to a pressing problem. Construction materials were in short supply after the end of the First World War, and making ships out of steel was prohibitively expensive. The SS Palo Alto was made out of concrete, just to prove that such a thing could be done. Everyone applauded the achievement, but nobody could find a good use for her. By 1929, she was a floating party boat with an onboard casino, dance hall, and arcade. Sadly, the Great Depression of the 1930s put an end to all of her fun, and she's been empty and lifeless ever since. What's left of her now is in Monterey Bay, falling apart. Various pieces of the ship have already broken off and sunk beneath the surface, and the rest will likely follow in the very near future. At least the fish and birds seem to appreciate her. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.